Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. Today, a hell of a lot to get through. Now, before we get into this video, a quick little disclaimer. Unfortunately, I'm not well at all. I've got a bit of a flu and as soon as I'm done shooting this video and editing, I'm going back to bed. My throat is on fire. I feel absolutely rotten. Um, but I didn't want to leave you guys without uh, something to watch. You guys know that I soldier on regardless. The only thing that's gonna stop me is, uh, or has stopped me from making videos is, uh, yeah, serious major organ failure. <laughs> if you guys have been following, you would have uh, known my history with uh, my health issues. But anyway, <clears throat> so my throat is on fire. I'm gonna just be, I've got some really good tea here. <laughs> keep um, hydrated and keep going. Now, first of all, as a treat, because I'm feeling a little rotten, I've Netflixed Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger um, as a little treat. I haven't ever seen, I've, I've seen parts of it, but I haven't seen this. If you guys remember, I did the video about my top uh, favorite 10 films with watches and um, so, now I included, what was it, Predator with Arnie's, the Arnie, I think it's the H558, or is it the 88, I can never remember reference numbers, but you know the watch I'm talking about. I think he wears the same watch in this movie, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, watching that. Secondly, we're, in a moment we'll be discussing, uh, hang on, these are the wrong notes. I've got the wrong notes here. Ah, oh, here we go. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place today. I'm a little bit, I mean, yesterday I, it was worse, but today, thankfully, I, I'm able to string a sentence together. So I'm gonna do my five loves and loathes of the Zin uh, 104. I've currently got it on this stunning gray suede uh, strap from Flacco that I got from Holbens. So we'll be discussing that in just a moment. Before we get into this, I've got to do wristwatch check and slightly inspired by the Rolex we're taking a look at later, I'm wearing my Tissot Genero. This is a Tissot, not a Timex. <laughs> I'm not gonna muck it up this time, but um, yeah, very 1930s inspired, telling me to scale there. Gorgeous, I mean, very, quite rare now. So you'll see why I wore it kind of you know, it's, it's got to do with the Rolex we're gonna discuss later. So anyway, let's roll the intro and get into today's video. on to the Zin because it's related to the Zin. Let's do a countdown of the top 20. Now I have the results here. Uh, you guys voted. This is the top 20 watches. New. This is not used. <clears throat> Excuse me. As voted by the UGWC the Facebook group. There's a link in the description if you are not a member. It's free to join. And there was I don't know, 50, 60 nominations. So we'll start at number 20. Number 20, the Longines Heritage flagship. I mean, it doesn't really get much more Longines than that. It, it really doesn't. In fact, when I envisage Longines in my mind, that's what I think about. I have not tried this watch, so I've got to get it in. At 19, the Christopher Ward C60. Yes, I've reviewed this watch. Fantastic. Very, very much under the, the $1,000 range. 18, one of my personal favorites, the Glycine Airman and number one, this, I think this is the slightly smaller 36. This of course is a GMT watch, hugely iconic. It predates the Rolex GMT, I think by a few years. Uh, Glycine, a brand I absolutely adore. Very glad that got in there. At 17, the Alpina Sea Strong. This is a really cool diving watch. Alpina is another brand. I'm, I'm trying to get them to lend me watches for review. They're being a little bit slow, but it's a, it would be nice if they uh, if they sent something in to review. Guys, if you own an Alpina, do email me and you're willing to lend it in. I'm dying to look at that brand. I love their chronograph, especially the vintage stuff. 
Great brand. 16, the Oris Big Crown Pro Pilot. Yes, absolutely. You guys know I love Oris. I really love the look of this one. Some of the best aviation and diving watches at this price range, without a doubt. Fiercely, 100 years independent, outstanding brand. Uh, so that was 16. 15, the Zin 556. It's the entry level Zin, however, it's minimalist tool aesthetic it's slightly kind of flieger ish but it's gorgeous i all i came this close to buying one myself fantastic you guys know i love zin so that's at 15 really glad there's a few zins in here at 14 the stover classic flieger so yes i'm so glad there's a lot of german brands in there because amazing value for money uh, so that was 14. 13 longines heritage 1945 as the name suggests very 1940s inspired in its looks gorgeous watch at 12 one of my personal favorites the squire 60 atmos so this is the bigger brother of the squire 1521 very 60s in design i actually reviewed this watch hugely hugely underrated in my opinion i mean you guys know i love the squire 1521 but i actually think this is squire best watch technically the quality is even improved they are built like absolute tanks, a whole different level to the Squalor 1521. So that was 12, sorry. At 11, we got the Nomos Orion. I have reviewed this piece as well. Beautiful, minimalist Bauhaus, German made, very thin, elegant. Uh, what more is there to say? I love that watch. I've also reviewed that one. So now we're getting in the top 10. At 10, we have the Tag Hoya Aqua Racer, fantastic. I love the Aqua Racer. I've also reviewed one of them, the more kind of brutalist styled one. Automatics, of course. I actually almost bought one myself. Uh, I mean, I almost bought all of these, <laughs> you know, if I haven't bought them. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that was 10. Number nine, very happy about this. Federic Constant Slimline Moonface Automatic. Gorgeous watch, very, very classic. Federic Constant are just offering so much for so little. Relatively new brand. I believe they were bought by Citizen now, Swiss made, of course. It's a beautiful, more affordable alternative to, let's say, you know, the, the Juju Le Coultre ultra thin watches. Um, or is it Master Ultra Thin? I can never remember. Sorry, my mind is not with me today. But yeah, I love the, the decoration and the movement on this. It's really gorgeous. So that was number nine. Number eight, the Oris. Diver 65. Now, I haven't reviewed the standard version. I reviewed the special edition, the bronze. Uh, Carl Brashear, I, I reviewed that version of it. I love it. I love it. I love that watch. Who owns one? I have a friend of mine who owns this gorgeous. Very retro, 60s inspired. Oris really have so many affordable divers at this price range. They dominate the, this this hole here. So that was number eight. Number seven, the Longines Legend Diver, which I actually have here. I'm going to review very, very soon. Stay tuned. I'm running a little bit behind. Well, I'm always behind with my reviews, but now I've, I've been sick a couple of days. So um, yeah, very retro inspired. That inner rotating bezel automatic, of course. How many Longines is that? One, two, three Longines in this in this poll, fantastic. It's dominated by German watches, by Oris, by Longines. Fantastic. That's this is this is such a fun price range. Anyway, um, so that was seven. Number six, a Tudor. Yes, we got a Tudor in there. The Tudor Ranger, of course. I think it's about forty-one millimeters. Um, I love the, their vintage Rangers, although the prices have shot up. Uh, it's a kind of, I guess it's Tudor's version of the Rolex Explorer. A little dash of red there, I think on the second hand, if I remember correctly. Gorgeous. Automatic, of course. I mean, you guys know I love Tudor. So that was number six. Number five, the Seiko Marine Master 300. Absolutely. Who was it that bought this? Oh, Jeremy, of course. One of the um, the right honourable admins of the of this very group. Uh, just bought one gorgeous watch. Big, it's macho, it's Seiko's higher end diver, automatic of course, very tooly. The curves of the case, it's just, it's it's very rugged and, and, and macho, you know, and I think it suits uh, Jeremy's style perfectly. And I would almost say it's kind of, it's luxury standard in its finishing, gorgeous watch. So that was number five, <coughs> excuse me. Number four, Junghands, the Max Bill Automatic. Yes, another German brand, 
a favorite watch, an iconic watch. The originals were, of course, designed in collaboration with Max Bill, so real Bauhaus, you know, because he graduated from the school there, of course. Minimalist, stylish, iconic. What more can we say? I've, I've, I've also reviewed one of these as well. Um, shout out to my good friend Arthur there. Uh, so have a look back in the archives. So that was number four. Number three, Nomos, again, the Nomos Club. I'm not familiar with this one. I prefer the Orion, just a matter of taste, but rarely cool to see the club up there. Fantastic, beautiful, such good taste, such good taste, guys. I mean, there isn't one watch here that I don't like, you know? Um, fantastic, it makes me proud of, of, of to be part of this community. Uh, so that was number three. Number two, the Aquas, an automatic diver from Oris, of course. And what's great about the Aquas is there's, you know, you got the entry level with the date, and then you got the chronographs, then you got the super high end, well, not super high end, but the higher end, you have the depth gauge, which is just a, a fantastic complication, a serious, serious dive watch. I only wish they had a 40 millimeter version. I would, you know, I can't find them anyway. I tried to buy one the other month again, you know, for the third time. And I'm glad it's at number two because it's one of the first watches I reviewed on the channel and it actually inspired me to start the channel because I, I felt watches at this price range were not getting enough attention. I mean, nowadays it's all changed. Everybody and their, and their mother is on YouTube. Its design is so unique. It's so, it, it was a breath of fresh air. It feels, a, a, there's a little bit of blank band 50 fathoms in, in there, but yet it's modernist, it's contemporary, the lug guards, the case, the ceramic bezel, everything about it is so endearing. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got to have another sip of the tea here. Oh, much better. So, yeah, I, it's a very important watch and not a month goes past that I don't consider rebuying it. Anyway, so what's at number one? So that was number two. What is at number one? Well, it's no surprise. It's the Zin 104. My darling little Zin 104. This is my second one. I actually did rebuy it. Uh, it's important for me to have a German watch in the collection. I really think this watch is a classic in the making. As it's number one, let's discuss my five loves and loathes. Now, it was a really difficult watch to, to do the, the hates, the five hates. Although, you know, I'm, it's, I just do it because that's what the trend is on, on YouTube. I don't, I don't hate anything about this watch, to be honest. There are watches that I love more than the Zin 104, that I rate higher than the Zin 104. Even my Submariner, I can find more things I hate about the Submariner than I do about this watch. That's just how amazing this watch is. So let's start with the, the five best or five good things, positives about this watch. Number one, it's design, undoubtedly. I think Zin just hit a home run when they designed this watch. Everything about it, the proportions, the scale of everything in relation to everything else, the crown guards, the angles of the lugs, the dial layout, the little minute markings, the syringe style hands, the display back, they have even decorated the movement uh, very, very nicely. For a watch at this price range, incredible. I love its Thule aesthetic, although at 11 millimeters, it wears almost quite dressy. You could put it on a beautiful strap like I have, and you could get away with it wearing it formal occasions, although a little bit of a faux pas, there is an elegance to it. And I think that is a testament to its classic design. It's clean, yet functional. The watch design takes Zin back to its roots. A simple design without clutter or without gimmicks. You see the case being used in the chronographs. It's the same case. Now guys, I have reviewed this watch. So if you want to find out more about its technical specifications, have a look at the review, I'll, I'll leave a link up there. That everything has been so well considered in the design and, and it translates to how you feel when you wear the watch. Anyway, we'll get onto that in just a moment. So number two, so that wasn't my first positive, number two or first love. Number two, 
the value for money. So it's priced at about 1200, a little bit more for the bracelet version. I'm not really big into bracelets, as you know. The only watch I ever wear on the bracelet is, is my Rolex Submariner because it's got the best bracelet and clasp in the world, in my opinion. So it's quite a bargain, I think, at the price range it's set at. Tremendous value for money. And I've also got to say, it keeps its price impeccably well. If you've ever heard watch snobs say, oh, you know, watches at this price range do not keep their uh, their money, absolute hogwash. It's absolute rubbish. This watch, when I first bought it, I almost sold it for literally not even $100 less than what I bought it for. That is how strong the demand is. That is how strong Zin is, which is quite unheard of at this price range. So it's just proof that it's a solid brand and that shows value for money and that shows that this watch really is a great value proposition. There's a ton of attention to detail here. It gives the feeling of a luxury timepiece. And I said this in, in my very first review of the watch and in my second one when I revisited it a year or so later. It's nipping at the heels of the big boys. It's comparable to brands like Omega uh, in the finishing. It really is. So that's tremendous value for money. Okay, my third love is it's the perfect everyday watch. The complication, the day-date complication, is very legible and easy to read. It's a very useful complication. I always forget what day of the week it is. <clears throat> Excuse me, so for me, very, very easy. Also, the countdown bezel, although it's a little bit unusual, it's very useful for cooking and, and everyday tasks. It's also bi-directional, um, so it just, it's a bit easier to set. You don't have to wind, you know, um, turn it all the way around. You can set it easily. It's also very robust, uh, which we'll get onto in a, in a moment with my, which, what point is this, uh, with my, uh, my fourth point. I also think it's it's very wearable. It's styling just goes with everything. It's hard not to wear. So that's definitely my third love of the watch. It's a great everyday. It's the perfect everyday watch. Okay, so that was number three. Number four, performance. Now, Zin State. Let me just get this the quote correct. They say that. The, mo the base movement, because it is a Celita SW200, uh, although they have modified it, they've added the custom rotor, the blued screws, actually very nicely decorated, I must say. The performance is impeccable. Now, it's not chronometer certified, although they say it's chronometer grade equivalent. I have a feeling they've, they've well, I'm fairly certain they've regulated it out of the factory, both times I've, I've bought this watch, it performs impeccably well. Not only that, the loom is outstanding, very, very clear and legible. The hands are generous, you can easily distinguish between the hands and which way up the watch is from the loom. Not only that, you've got 200 meters water resistant, which makes it, you can go, you could, in theory, you could go diving with this watch. It's an aviation pilot watch, but yet, you can go diving with it. It's quite incredible. You know, obviously it has the screw down crown. You got sapphire on the front and the back, beautifully subtly domed on the on the front. Usually at this price range, you'll see companies they'll put sapphire on the front, but then they'll put you know um, acrylic or whatever on the on the display back. No, zingo all the way, and I love that. That you know it performs incredibly. It's also low pressure uh, resistant. They've drop tested it. They've done a whole bunch of testing and, and Zin are excellent at, at doing that. It doesn't have the, the, all the technology that Zin have developed in their higher end pieces, but the expertise, the, the craftsmanship is there. You feel it, performs impeccably well. Okay, and lastly, I gotta say, it's one of the most versatile watches. And this is something that kind of, again, proves that it's a classic or a classic in the making. If you look at the Submariner, if you look at the uh, Speedmaster, uh, the Omega Speedmaster, if you look at any iconic classic watch, they're very versatile. Dress this up on a crocodile, it will look amazing. Put it on a NATO, put it on a rubber strap, it's just very, very versatile. Um, in fact, to such an extent, you know, it's, it's, 
You could almost say it's the only watch you, you really ever need. Um, it's not only versatile in its accessorization, but it's also versatile in its application, as the water resistance is so high, but for anything, any situation. So definitely, versatility is one of its major, major strong points. So let's go on to negatives because this is the really challenging part. I've never had such a difficult time finding negatives for a watch and it, it's very difficult. Anyway, my first little gripe is the countdown bezel. I'm so used to the standard dive time bezel of divers that this being in reverse, because it, you know, it's countdown, you've got 55 where normally you'd have five minutes, it's in reverse. It threw me off a little, to begin with. There's a little bit of a, uh, not a learning curve, but you have to get used to it. Not a major downfall, um, however, I, I must mention that. Some people really don't like the countdown bezel. They're just, they're just, they just don't like it. I can understand it. Bit of a Marmite effect, I think, uh, but a great complication nonetheless. Secondly, now this is probably my major negative of this watch. I wish it had drilled lug holes. It's such a strap monster that if it had, I, I think it would suit its, its tooly aesthetic. Some people will be like, oh, well, no, I think it would ruin the elegance of the, of the lugs, those beautiful um, beveled edge lugs. They are quite angular. I do love the lugs. It's so much easier. You don't scratch the case. So I think it would have really suited it. Okay, so that was number two. Number three, they are always sold out. It's a victim of its own success. The times I've gone to watch buys and, and tried to buy one and, oh, it's sold out. Then I kind of forgot about it. I came back a month later, sold out. I actually had to, I bought this, my rebuy is actually a swap. I swapped it, it was a part exchange for a watch and, and, and some money. So I had, to, I had to buy it essentially on the used market. Uh, and a lot of people do. Now unfortunately here in the United States, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any stores. I mean, I'm, probably there is uh, Zinn available here in New York, but it's, for most people in the United States, especially if you live out further away from big cities, it's difficult to try these watches on. You're gonna have to order it online. So I think that's a, a big negative for this watch and the brand in general is that, uh, you know, I, I never tried this watch on when I bought it the first time. I, I was looking at pictures. I took a gamble, you know, I had already got had the channel for a little while. So I took a gamble, it paid off massively. Other times it hasn't. It would be nice to be able to try it on. Unfortunately, Zinn is still very much a watch enthusiast brand. It's still very, <clears throat> excuse me, under the radar. There's advantages to that as well, but there's also disadvantages. Um, so it's a shame it's always sold out and you can't really try them on. So that is my third negative or hate number four. And you're going to roll your eyes at this and yeah, I'm sick of saying it as well. I wish it was a fraction, a flick smaller in diameter. Had this been even a 39 or a 38 millimeter watch, it would have been perfect, just perfection. It's already, you know, close to perfection. Just for me, this is just for me. However, I gotta say for, for most people, it suits their wrists absolutely fine. So it, it's, it's very much a personal, hate or pet peeve or loathe or whatever, however you want to call it. Um, for, sorry, I've got to have some more tea. Yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I say this basically in every video <laughs> ever, and I, I apologize, I'm sick of saying it. It's just, you know, skinny wrist problems, skinny first world wrist problems. Uh, number five, it makes me question spending more money on watches. Now, how is that a hate? Well, recently I was uh, approached by a viewer who had, I think, a $50,000 budget and he wanted to buy, two, uh, he wanted a two watch collection, he wanted my um, recommendations. I, I love uh, watches of all levels, as you guys know, but the feeling this watch gives me, it makes me question spending any more on a watch, it really does. When it, and it's a, it's a fantastic thing, but it kind of makes me reevaluate watches on, on a higher level. Um, it almost makes me think that spending any more money on watches is, is not distasteful, but 
maybe it's a little overindulgent. It's so classic, this watch. It's so restrained and yet functional and tastefully done that it makes me question spending more money on watches. I, I could, at moments, I look at this watch and I just feel, well, you know, what more do you want? This and a G-Shock, you don't really need anything more in life. There are certain watches that are gateway watches that get you into the hobby and then there are watches like this that are just like, I don't need anything more. <laughs> so it makes me quit. How is that a negative? Well, guys, to be honest, I, I came up with four. I think I'm pretty, pretty chuffed with that. My fifth one is just, it makes me question this, this hobby. The ridiculousness of, of wanting more expensive watches. Not really a hatred, but I think I did pretty well. I came up with four and a half, four and a half. Please do uh, share your thoughts, your hates, your loves of this watch, especially if you are an owner. I'd love to hear your feedback on this. So let's move on now to the coolest Rolex of all time. And it was part of the um, inspiration for wearing my Tissot Janeiro because this of course is a 1930s inspired design. It's a reissue of some classic, classic chronographs that Tissot did in collaboration with Le Mania way back in the 1930s. So what is this Rolex? Well, this is a World War II Heroes uh, Rolex and it was auctioned off. Now this article is from Bear News. Uh, I believe they're an auctioneer and antique specialist in the United Kingdom. So a big thank you to them and I must give credit for, for uh, this beautiful article. This was auctioned off a little while ago. I'll, I'll, I'll reveal the price at the end. I'll also leave a link to this article if you want to find out more and have a, have a butcher's at this incredible, incredible uh, watch. I'll leave a link in the description. So this was auctioned in December the 2nd, 2015. This is a rare Rolex chronograph and it was included with the medals of a World War II RAF officer shot down by the Gestapo in 1944. Now this watch belonged to Flight Lieutenant John Francis Williams and he was known as Jack and he was the 67th Allied officer to escape through Tunnel Harry during the Great Escape. Now you all guys, you guys have all seen the movie with Steve McQueen. So this uh, was the inspiration behind the story of that movie. Now this was he escaped in March 1944. Now what makes this fascinating and makes this the coolest Rolex of all time is that this Rolex was actually ordered while he was in the camp, and it was delivered to him uh, from Rolex to the camp in Germany. Where was the camp? I think it was... Here we go. This of course is the Stalag Luft 3. So Jack, of course, he was part of the 107th Squadron uh, at RAF Great Messingham. And he used to pilot, I believe, the uh, Douglas Boston 3 bombers of the 107th. Now the article goes in great detail and, and he's He's pretty much the stereotypical kind of RAF officer, you know, driving. There's even a picture here of his 1936 MG midget. But what makes this watch so cool is that it was ordered and he and it was delivered to him while he was in the camp. And I believe it was used to time training for the for the great escape, obviously. So it, it actually assisted in the digging. I think there were about three or four tunnels made. This was a camp with both British and American prisoners of war in it. If you haven't seen The Great Escape with Steve McQueen, I do, I do urge you to check it out. Classic, classic war movie. In fact, actually, I've got to add it to my DVD collection. But if we look at the watch itself, let's have a scroll down. It has that classic telemeter scale, that beautiful black dial with the gold gilt print on it. Now, I'm not sure, but it looks like, because the images are not that good, but it looks like a column wheel, it's obviously manual wind, column wheel chronograph. Gorgeous. I mean, this is the, the chronograph dreams are made of. Forget, forget the, the, the Paul Newman Daytona. This is so much cooler because I think it was kept by, an, uh, I think it says here, it was kept by an American because he, unfortunately, he was executed by the Gestapo, but it was kept and given back to his family after the war. Uh, so this is the reference, let's have a look. This is the reference 
3525. It was made in 1943. You know, with the two pushes there, uh, the, the spacing of the, the sub dials. Just look at that. Look at that dial. I mean, come on, Rolex. You've got, <laughs> you've got to make some chronographs like this. It had the oyster case, of course. It had the oyster case. And you can see on one of the pictures, there's a little... Um, he's even kept the, the original label, and it says that the oyster watch is still dust and perspiration proof, but will not withstand immersion in water. So this, this is a very early oyster case. It's even got the original strap. I mean, that kind of cognac... A leather strap. I mean, you can. I, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna try and mimic this. I think I'm gonna buy a cognac-coloured leather strap with the same stitching and try and do the. Uh, I'll do the Great Escape. I, I should call this the Great Escape. Really. There's even the documentation and the medals. The the, the uh, Jack's medals there. So cool. I mean, this is what dreams. I mean, this is a real Grail. So how much did it go for? Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Well, uh, according to my research, it sold for a staggering £165,000. That's pounds, not dollars. So, wow. So it, it just makes the Paul Newman look <laughs> like, uh, uh, you know, a very quite modest in comparison. But, I mean, definitely, the, the price is justified. Owned and used by a war hero in the field. Probably the coolest story behind any watch I've ever heard. The fact it's a Rolex chronograph, it's already not a common thing. Um, it's just unbelievably cool and, you know, very grail worthy. I mean, it's just what dreams are made of. I'm exhausted, my throat is on fire. I'm going to take a, one of these, uh, Echinacea, honey lemon with Echinacea, a throat drop. I'm going to get to bed and I'm going to watch Commando, give you an update on Seiko Saturday. Actually, I'll try and get some screen captures of uh, Arnold um, <laughs> Seiko. Anyway, I'm exhausted and I feel absolutely terrible. So, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Let's just pop that in. Mm. Thank you very, very much for watching. Please don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, questions, opinions, all the rest of it in the comments below. I'm off to bed. Hopefully, I'll feel better for the next video. Um, yeah, don't forget to like this video. I'm, I'm forgetting what I'm, I'm forgetting my thing. Don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, ciao.